A wall of blue today, that for the funeral of Officer Randolph Holder in Queens earlier today. We will talk to fellow officers who attended to see how they're dealing with the fourth NYPD cop killed in the line of duty in less than a year. Then we will shift gears to politics and take a look at the third Republican debate starting just two hours from now. All eyes will be on Donald Trump or will somebody else feel the spotlight and get a big bump coming out of Calling Eye of Colorado. Also, this shocking story out of South Carolina. The officer who body slammed this student then dragged her out of the classroom. Well, he has been fired today. Police are saying the girl hit the cop. We'll ask our legal panel if that even matters. Good evening and welcome to RFL. I am Richard French. Thank you so much for joining us. And we start with the funeral of another New York Police Department officer killed in the line of duty. Thousands of fellow police officers, families, and friends gathered in Queens this afternoon for the funeral of NYPD officer Randolph Holder. Mr. Holder was shot in the head while pursuing a suspect in Upper Manhattan last week. And Mayor de Blasio, he was there as a show of support, and he spoke at the service. Our city lost a remarkable man, a man who made us better by his presence. You've heard already some of the things he achieved, and we're only getting a small sense of the warmth, the humanity, the kindness, the smile he wore so often on his face, the witty turn of a phrase that was so ready at the tip of his tongue. Our own Dominic Carter, he was outside the ceremony, and he spoke with police officers who were there to pay their respects. Officer, you're from Florida. Correct. Why are you here? Uh, I think it's very important these days to stick together. And when we lose a brother or a sister, it affects all of us, no matter what part of the country we're in. How tough nationwide is the job these days that you do on a daily basis? It's uh, getting tougher and tougher. Unfortunately, people are only seeing the negativity, I feel like, a lot. And uh, we're out there, you know, we work 11 and a half hour shifts. And in the course of that, we affect a lot of people's lives and we make their lives better. We make it uh, truly make a difference. So it's unfortunate that a lot of times we're getting all the publicity for all the negative that maybe a few officers may do while there's so many of us out there doing good. Very sad day for you? Very sad. Honor of fallen officer, brother officer. I have almost 29 years on the job and it's just, uh, it's like losing a family member. That's it basically. How tough? is the job these days. You've lost four colleagues in 11 months. It's getting tougher and tougher every day to, you know, be an NYPD officer, law enforcement in general. He, he decided not to come, Reverend Sharpton. What type of reaction do you think he would have no, no received? No comment. No comment. How tough is today? How tough is today as far as being here at this funeral? Oh, this is tough. You know, we come down to support our brothers in blue. Uh, you know, it's a rare opportunity for us. We work in a building, in a facility, you know, where you don't really get this opportunity that often. So uh, our commissioner, deputy commissioner, authorized us to come down to support this, this event. Yeah. To support one of your own? Yes, yeah. It is very tough because this is like the third one I've been to uh, from representing Westchester County for New York City. Uh, it's like the third funeral I've been to. And how past, long? This is the past 14 months. Uh, I believe there was three or four, you know. I came to three of them. Three of them. And it's, it's, it's a shame. Now, Officer Holder, he was a third-generation police officer. Both his father and grandfather were cops in Holder's native Guyana. In fact, Holder's body will be flown to that country for burial. Holder, as mentioned, the fourth NYPD cop killed on duty in less than a year. Officers Wen Jin Liu and Rafael Ramos, they were murdered in Brooklyn last December. And Officer Brian Moore gunned down in Queens earlier this year, in fact, in the spring. Dominic Carter, political journalist and author, and Andrew Whitman, our senior political correspondent, join me now. Dominic, you were there. Um, it's not common the cops will even go on camera, certainly right. at a funeral and talk. But... Um, you know, thankfully, there was we avoided uh, what could have been a sideshow if uh, Reverend Sharpton did not only attend but also speak. He um, withdrew um, earlier in the week 
um, forgetting that element to it, just from the guys you spoke to, and I imagine the vast majority, if they could go on camera, would probably echo the same sentiments that this has been a really tough year for cops. Richard, none of us fully understand until how difficult this is for them, how heartbreaking this is for them. As one officer said, it's like losing a family member. And standing there in that sea of blue, it was pouring rain. And not one of them, out of the thousands and thousands, the video we showed you doesn't fully capture the thousands of officers from all over the country that were out there. And in the rain, no one left. They, they stayed there. And, I, you know, I, on a personal level, I don't like covering funerals, but I can tell you this, once the bagpipes start and you hear the emotion, it's like an emotional attachment, and then you think about the fact that this individual in that coffin a day before was alive and well, a young person thriving, and now they've given their life all in the name of protecting you and I. Obviously, Andrew, there's so many different ways uh, we can go, and, and we've talked about this, unfortunately, at prior um, shows, obviously, the commonalities, uh, guns, um, uh, you know, uh, murders, uh, questions about the city, the political elements mm -hmm. with the mayor and the police unions and all this, but setting all that aside, it was actually out of the FBI, a comment, and I'll speak with the legal panel later in a different way, but um, Comey, uh, Director Comey, you said, this eyes on cops phenomenon that's happened right now has uh, created a much different climate for police and it's made it less safe, safe for police and more difficult um, to do policing as a consequence right now. And he's talking obviously about the prevalence of you know, cameras sure. everywhere, not just the body cameras, the dashboard cams with people basically, uh, he claims, taunting cops or just having the phones out as soon as police enter. Right or wrong, there's a palpable sense. I guarantee if we did an informal poll from the police that were there, white, brown, Asian, doesn't make a difference. Uniformly, they'll say it's a much more difficult climate now for cops. I don't know how that gets rectified because certainly the technology is not going away. I have no doubt that it's a more difficult climate for police officers. We, we hear that a lot from cops. We see it yep. in, in some of the headlines that we have coming through. This is a debate that we've had in our city, in our region, and across the country in the wake of other incidents and also with elections, for example, the mayoral election where de Blasio was elected, the role of police and, and how intrusive into the community they should be, how confrontational with the community they should be has come up as an issue. It's an ongoing debate and, and it should be. And we'll eventually find a new balance as we go through all of this. Uh, I feel for the cops, I, I really do. Their job is harder, but at the same time, I, I, I always come back to the thought that you know, some of this is put upon them by their fellow colleagues, that, that not enough good cops are, are keeping bad cops in check. Uh, and I think that's part of the, the, the problem that we're seeing as we come up with other police versus Reference community the incidents. Yeah. And, you know, everybody's job is harder these days, so. You know, um, the only, I, I, I'd agree even with that last line, except the consequences and the perception. Certainly. If you go back to the 70s and 80s, far more violent. If you looked at how many officers lost their lives in the line of duty in, in the course of every year in the late 70s, early 80s, it's much more significant. But nonetheless, uh, you know, we've been covering too many of these funerals. And the perception out there from the cops, and I'm going to defer to them, is they feel like targets often when they go in certain communities right now. Forget about even being treated with respect. It feels that there has been, um, you know, almost a perceptible permission by some to antagonize the cops that, you know, they're part of the problem. And I, I agree. We're going to show a video a little bit later about what happened in the classroom. Every day, you guys can tell the audience, uh, we get a clip of different stories filed from across this country that we, that we choose which ones we want to get into. There is a police a video every single day from a different dateline in this country where there seems to be either excessive force here or shooting that's questionable or whatever else. And before we didn't have that video, now you have it on a daily basis seemingly, mm -hmm. certainly on a weekly basis, but seemingly even more frequent than that. And of course it's compelling and of course it's going to get out there on the TV, but whether it's Baltimore, Missouri, whether it's, you know, Queens or whether it's, I'm sorry, Brooklyn, whether it's Staten Island, whatever, 
its story's not going away. And, and unfortunately, I don't know if there's a cause and effect, Dom, but you ask those folks that were in the funeral today, they're just going to say it is. They're there, there's, say there, there's definitely a cause and effect. The underlying theme uh, uh, from the officers that we talked to, most did not want to go on camera. But the underlying common denominator is that they feel that their jobs are now almost impossible with the popularity of the video cameras and so on. Not to say that they are signing off in approval of the actions of some. Some bad apples ruin it yep. uh, for everyone. But I want to come back, Richard, in conclusion uh, to Reverend Sharpton. You know that I, that I think he has a right to be a leader in the black mm -hmm. community. But after being there today, we were in the middle of uh, Queens, a predominantly uh, black community, Allen AME Church, Reverend Floyd Flake is the uh, pastor there, prominent black, middle-class mm -hmm. black community. It's a good thing that he didn't come. It's a good thing. Police officers are professional, and I don't know what would have happened, but as far as whether or not they would have turned their backs on them or whatever, but they, they're hurting. They are really, I yep. cannot emphasize that enough. Police officers are hurting, mm. and it would have been almost like throwing a match, igniting a, a gasoline and, fire. And, and certainly you don't want it at a funeral. Politics get involved. Uh, real quick, there's one last one. I, went, I know we're not going to have a lot of time to talk about, but the suspect right now um, that, um, that pulled the trigger. This is not a choir boy. He's had a, uh, uh, a decent arrest record. There's the question, um, and I'll give credit to both the mayor and the police commissioner. They said the diversion program he was put in, instead of putting behind bars because he had a drug offense that led to this, um, there's questions that it's an imperfect system, but they don't believe it should be thrown out entirely as a consequence. That said, though, you look at this guy and you really wonder if maybe he shouldn't have been back on the street um, after his most recent arrest. I know that's Monday morning quarterbacking, but when you look at who he was and his history, it's a legitimate question to say maybe we got to revisit a lot of these programs because, or at least have more discretion in these programs. One fallen police officer is one too many. One incorrectly victimized member of the community at the hands of police or anybody else is one too many. And one criminal, lifelong criminal, who goes to the justice system and is spit back out onto the street is one too many. It's all about finding the balance and figure, and that's a moving target. And that's something that we're going to have to continue to focus on and, and continue to adjust to. And that's, <clears throat> that's part of the ongoing process. And, and as I, well I as know you're short on time. Yeah. I wish I could be as compassionate as Andrew on this topic. Perhaps <clears throat> my response should be his. But I know that half of these clowns, they use, unfortunately, they use uh, drug issues as a way of bypassing jail. This criminal... I can go on and on. Should have, should not have been on the street. Period. Yeah. No bleeding heart liberal. Yeah, oh, and I want to tell you, the police, by the stuff. way, the Fraternal Order of Police, by the way, <clears throat> they support these diversion programs because mm -hmm. they think these guys that go in, it is. You're right. I, I think there is discretion and there's judgment involved because some of these guys come out worse than they are when they go in if they're just drug users. But if they're a thug that happened to be arrested in a drug thing, putting them back out here... Uh, you know, uh, it's it's too easy to sit in a, a you know temperature controlled uh, studio and say what should or shouldn't happen after the fact here. But I, I believe that there's going to be a reassessment of the program. Anyway, nice job, Dom. All right, when we come back, we'll talk some politics. It's debate night here for Republicans. The third debate. We'll tell you what to look for right after this.